Morning, everyone. I, I was going to do the talk quietly and see if John had panicked over whether I was muted or not, but I just thought I'd, I'd crack on. Um, it's been pointed out that there is a clock behind Jono's head. I can't actually see it. So um, if, um, if I start going on too long, um, feel free to um, signal in an appropriate manner. All right. And we'll, yeah, wave. Okay, waving's fine. I, no, not yet. Give me a few minutes. Um, so uh, we'll see how we get on. So if you can cast your minds back to, to last month, um, we were originally given three topics. I got through one and seven eighths, so I probably will not cover the, that, that eighth, but we'll go um, mainly on to adoption. But so, so last time we thought of um, how doctrine is, is what the whole Bible teaches us about a particular subject. And it's quite, it's quite important that we, we keep that in the back of our minds when we go through these, these topics. We're not just picking one verse and, and building, um, building a doctrine on that or, or that's becoming everything to us. We're, we're seeing what the Bible has to say and it's important that we, we really get to grasp with that. So last time we, we really briefly covered, uh, it may not felt like briefly, but we briefly uh, covered conversion where we, we looked at the, the response to the gospel call that, that David had talked on a few uh, weeks earlier um, in where we, we sincerely repent of our sin and we place our trust in, in the Lord Jesus for our salvation. And we, we thought a, a bit about what conversion meant, about turning, um, turning from sin in repentance and turning to the Lord Jesus in faith. And uh, we spent some some time just thinking through what that meant, and then then after that we went on to to justification, where we we saw that justification was a um, an instantaneous legal act of God. It's something that God does, in which He He thinks of us our sins as forgiven, and as Christ's righteousness belonging to us, and He declares us. And this is important, isn't it? He declares us to be righteous in his sight. What a, a, what a thrill, what a blessing that is. You know, sometimes we think of, of doctrines being dry and stuffy and, you know, for those academics over there. But actually, the truths in it should really excite us, should excite our souls to think that as Christians, having been converted like we saw, and how... How, Christ, how, the, how God declares us to be righteous. Okay, so think about that during the day, if nothing else. And this morning, um, this morning we're going to continue in the set of three that we started off with, and we're going to look at this this doctrine of adoption. And as I was um, as I was uh, going through various books and studying, it's really interesting that actually. The doctrine of adoption seems to be some of the the least taught, uh, the least thought through, or maybe thought out of probably a lot of the doctrines that we would we would know about. So actually, the more I looked into adoption, the more exciting it becomes, and I want you to get excited about this doctrine because the truths behind it should have real should have a real impact on our lives. Okay, Gruden, and we will come back to it. So, yes, we, we're following Gruden, and a lot of what I say will come from Gruden. Some of it will come from from other areas. Um, some of you may or may know may or may not know um, a family in the area called the Trumpers. Um, well, I think, and I'm assuming it's their son Tim Trumper, who's a pastor now in America. I found his uh, his theses are uh, on adoption. Um, when, when he was doing his, his doctorate. Um, if you want to read the 500 pages on that, feel free, you can Google it. Um, I started, didn't get too far, um, but it's there. So there are stuff out there if you, if you look for it. Well, Gruden defines adoption as an act of God whereby he makes us, he makes me a member of his family. An act of God whereby he makes me, us, members of his family. 
that's when, when we grasp that i think i'd like to think in its entirety but when we start to grasp what that means that should have a real impact in our lives and on our lives and the way in which we live you see you see in conversion it's one of those events isn't it that that we have a part in if i can put it that term it's it's not because of us we know that we're, we're not converted god doesn't um, save us because there's any good in us but we are involved because we're the ones that god changes i suppose from that perspective however in in justification and in adoption both of them are something that only god does yeah and so we just need to be don't we so grateful in what god does he does it completely so when we thought about regeneration you know he gives us life and he does it from the inside he gives us this new heart the bible talks a lot about that doesn't it we become new creatures he does it to us in in justification god gives us a right legal standing before him he does it to us as well he declares us to be righteous and in in adoption god makes us members of his own family it's not something that we do god adopts us and if you like in each of these steps okay they are to all intents and purposes instantaneous but in each of these steps he draws us closer to himself and the one thing we need to get our heads around this morning is that our god is a relational god he wants he desires us to have a relationship with him so think about that too and so this morning we will deal with what it means to have a relationship with god and guys it's not just with god it's with other members of the family all right so that means the church yeah other brothers and sisters in christ we're to have a relationship with them just as much as we have a relationship because we have a relationship with god i would suggest um for those of you who like reading then um if you get hold of uh j.i packer's book knowing god he summarizes the the gospel the good news of christianity in just three words and i liked that okay he, he said this adoption through propitiation adoption through propitiation now propitiation is a big word isn't it it just means a a sacrifice that pleases god's wrath against our sin but that's the way he summed it up and when you think about those lines and as i read how many times do we think that the good news the gospel is about the purely about the forgiveness of sins that's it sins are forgiven it's good news well that is good news but that's not i think that's just scratching the surface of the good news yeah god deals with our sin why so that we might have a right relationship with him so in effect he forgives our sins so that we might be really and truly adopted into his family all true christians are adopted okay. we um, we went to uh, our son's church over in leicester it was for the the dedication of our granddaughter last year and um they had a, a guest speaker i think they may have mixed the dates up but they had a guest speaker and he was talking he was from a, a christian adoption adoption agency and it was really interesting so he was talking obviously about um if i think he, he said something along the lines that if each church a family in each church adopted a child who was in care the uk's adoption uh, the uk's uh, problems with children would disappear and he was suggesting that each not that each christian but a family maybe in each church would adopt a, a child and the church support them but when he was doing his introduction he asked the congregation to put their hands up if they were adopted um now a few people did 
my my brother-in-law is adopted so he put his hand up um and then there's probably about four or five in the congregation of several hundred and then he stopped and pointed out that if we were christians this morning we should all put our hands up because we are adopted we are all adopted into his family and that's what the bible tells us so paul paul uh taught a lot about adoption as well as the other apostles so romans 8 uh, verse 14 16 says this for all who are led by the spirit of god are sons of god for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we call abba father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And as, as you read the Bible, actually, it becomes clear, doesn't it? God is concerned with the family and with, with relationships. Yeah, how many times do we, do we see uh the, the bible speak in terms of a, a parent child relationship yeah how god is is our father we are we are his sons we are his daughters you know back in the old testament in, in malachi god scolded the the israel men for marrying the daughters of a foreign god jesus told the, the pharisees that they were of their father the devil and because we were of our father, the devil, for God to own us, we had to be adopted. Remember that Gruden definition? Adoption is an act of God whereby he makes us members of his family. Yeah, as I said, it's not just Paul. So John writing in, in uh, John 1, 12 says, but to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then Paul again in Galatians, Galatians 4, 4, 7. So I'm reading from ESV in case you're wondering. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God. This is where we get to cry out, isn't it? We get to shout that God, I don't like using the word dad in reference to God because it doesn't seem reverent enough, but it's that sort of relationship, isn't it? He is our father. And we get to shout that out. That should thrill our hearts. Now, I suppose we can have our view of fatherhood, whether we're fathers or had fathers. If, if our own fathers were good fathers, then, then calling God our father seems the most natural thing in the world. We, and it's easy if, if we've not had, perhaps we've had distant fathers or absent fathers or, you know, fathers who perhaps didn't treat us well, then we can stumble over this idea of calling God our father. But we have to, we have to remember that he is perfect. He is the perfect father and he loves us as his children perfectly. So sometimes, yeah, we, we have to be sensitive. But that doesn't mean we don't rejoice and love the fact that God is our father. And when we think about when this happens and, and how this happens, we might think that we were we were God's children by regeneration. You know, how many times do we hear the term being born again? And we use that, don't we, as Christians? You know, it's our, our church speak to be born again. And we might think that that's talking about adoption where actually the, the new testament never connects adoption with regeneration and that when i thought about that 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 blew my mind a bit because you know being born again that would make sense wouldn't it in fact 
the idea of adoption is is opposite to the idea of being born into a family that's not what we understand by adoption isn't it rather the new testament connects adoption with saving faith and says that that in response to us trusting in the lord jesus god adopts us into his family paul says in in galatians 3 23 to 26 for in christ jesus you are all sons of god through faith yeah and john writing in in 1 john 12 john 1 12 sorry but to all who received him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of god you know the verses these two in particular and others make it clear that adoption follows conversion and is god's response to our faith now yes it's in a it's in a blink of an eye but nevertheless we are adopted it because um of our faith in the lord jesus and adoption adoption is different it's it's distinct from from justification yeah adoption is a is a privilege that comes to us at a time when we become christians and yet it's it's a privilege that is distinct from justification and from regeneration remember in in regeneration we are made spiritually alive we're able to to relate to god in prayer and in worship yeah, we, we read and hear the Bible and we read it with receptive hearts. But it is possible that God could have created creatures, could have had creatures who are who are spiritually alive. And yet not members of his family. Yeah, just think of that for a minute. God could have creatures who are spiritually alive and yet not members of his family and don't share the, the, the special privileges of being members of the family. Think of the angels. Yeah, think of the angels. It's possible. Also, God, God could have given us justification. He could have declared us righteous without the privilege of adoption into his family. He could have he could have forgiven us of our sins and given us a, a right legal standing before him, actually without making us his children. So where regeneration has to do with our, our spiritual lives within, justification has to do with our, our standing before God's law. But adoption has to do with our relationship with God as our father. And it's it's in adoption we are given many of the the greatest blessings that we will know not just for now but for all eternity. And we all share the same rights, the same privileges as birth children. Yeah, Romans eight sixteen, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Um, I did a, a preached a series on Ephesians in July and uh, it was a real joy. It was a real privilege. Um, and even now I've moved on to, uh, to Joshua. I still, still think back and hark back to those teachings that you read in, in Ephesians and in Ephesians 1 verse 3 Paul says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places so what rights then what rights do we have what rights do we enjoy as children of God well I suppose the biggest one is that he is our father yeah 1 John 3 says this, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. What a... Yeah, what a what a joy, what a privilege that is, what a blessing it is that God is our Father. Writing in, in Psalm, Psalm 103, 
as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God loves us. He saved us. He's made us his children. Gruden says that the role that is most intimate and the role that conveys the highest privilege of fellowship with God for eternity is his role as our Heavenly Father. Just, just uh, meditate on that for a bit and, and feel the joy in your heart. Highest privilege of fellowship with God for eternity is his role as our Heavenly Father. So what are some of these privileges? There, there are there are many and we're not by any stretch of the imagination i will get people waving at me because we were out of time we start to to go through all of them in in any any length of detail but just a just a few to to whet your appetite we're told that we're to imitate god as our father 1 john 3 by th this is the evidence of who the children of god and who are the children of the devil whoever does not practice righteousness is not of god nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now, when, when we talk about imitating God, there are obviously some of his characteristics that we can't and should never hope to imitate. You know, we can't be omnipotent. We can't, you know, we can't be those characters that are specifically God, but there are some that we can. So we can be loving. We can show grace. We can show mercy to one another. There are, there are certain characteristics of God that, we are positively encouraged to to mimic if you like we're also led as as god's children we're led by the holy spirit uh, we've just uh, been touched on touched on that haven't we on a sunday when we've looked at the teaching um, of the holy spirit um, but we are led by the holy spirit in luke eleven thirteen, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will the heavenly father give the holy spirit to those who ask so there again heavenly father giving gifts to his beloved children spurgeon uh, he called the, the holy spirit the the hound of heaven and it's a it's a great uh, great title isn't it because he chases us doesn't he but, but when we see him for who he is, I was going to say the, the shoes on the other foot, we chase him. I'm not suggesting that, that he's trying to, to hide from us or elude him, but we want to chase after him. We want, to, we want a relationship, don't we? We want to know him more. We, we want to, to know a, a fullness of his presence with us. So we're led by the Holy Spirit as God's children. I suppose the next bit none of us like but actually it's for our benefit as his children he disciplines us yeah i thought long and hard about why um and i've looked at my own experience i suppose and i realized that i discipline my children the ones that I love and I think I probably discipline them and they'll probably tell you I've probably disciplined them too much at times and that's probably my my failings as a father but I realized that I would discipline my children where perhaps I wouldn't discipline those who weren't my children and actually it's true with God God disciplines us why because he loves us in, in Hebrew, Hebrews 12 verses 5 to 11 and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as my as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord what disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son in whom he receives. And then he goes on. If you were left without discipline, in which all hypostasis participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So 
if you've ever been disciplined or are under discipline by God, then know that you're loved by him. And you are his, his children, you are his son. But not only that, did you pick up that verse in, in Romans? As God's children, as heirs with, heirs with Christ, we will suffer like he did. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes we only think of the good stuff, don't we? And you see a lot of that, you know, everything's going to be fine when you become a Christian. No problems. But the truth is that we're called to suffer. 1 Peter 4, 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, wait for it, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So if you're insulted, not because you're obnoxious or I'm obnoxious, but if you're insulted for the name of Christ, then the Bible says we are blessed. I said at the beginning, not only not only is God interested and has a relationship with us as a, a father, father's child relationship, but also we're related to one another now. Now I haven't got any brothers, not not um, humanly speaking. Um, I've got two older sisters; they pick on me as older sisters do. But now I have brothers. I have brothers. I mean, we've called this brothers in Christ, but we have brothers, don't we? We are related to one another as Christians because we are God's children. Yeah, 1 John 3, 10. By this, it is evident that who are the children of God? Remember that verse? And who are the children of the, of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. It's, it's all about relationship, isn't it? It's all about relationship. So I don't know what you think about adoption. Don't know whether you've even thought about what it means to be adopted as God's children. But one thing we do need to be aware of, we need to be actively, yeah, I use the word that, actively concerned with one another. And if you're not, actually, John will go as far as to say that he would start to question whether you actually belong to God at all if you don't love your brothers and sisters. At best, maybe you do. But we're not only children. We're not the only child. We have a family. Yeah, I'm looking at the screen now. I'm not sure how many there are. There's, there's 20. Yeah, just, just here there are 20. 20 of my brothers who, who in Christ. If we're not, and here's a challenge for us, and it's a challenge for me as much as it is for you. If we're not loving and actively serving God's people, then we really need to question ourselves. Why not? If we claim, if we claim we're Christians and, and God is our father, then, then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Why are we living as if we're only children? Why aren't we taking a, um, I can say this because I'm no longer part of Ebenezer, why aren't we taking an active part, an active role in church? Now, that can mean anything. That can mean taking the offering, standing at the front, putting the chairs away, doing the teas and coffee. There's a whole raft of things that we can get in, included in. Bringing each other up. 
encouraging each other in the faith, keeping each other to account. You know, those are some of the, the practical things that we could and should and must be doing if we are truly God's children. We must love one another. Now, I know that does happen. But does it happen enough? Just, uh, just think of the, the impact it would have in mould and in church and further afield, I would suggest, if we loved one another in the way that the Bible describes that we should as brothers and sisters in Christ. Truly. Think what it would do within our local church in mould. Think what it would do in our family. Think of the impact it would have in mould and in our culture to see us truly living as God's children. Right at the beginning of the last talk, I, I, it was a challenge as much as anything. I used the word, so what? So what? I want you to think about that. Think about the things, not just today, not just last week, but the things that we hear in, in these talks, the things that we hear on a Sunday. I want you to use the so what. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean, what should this mean for me? How should this work out in my life? If I am a Christian, if I've known what it is to repent and put my faith in the Lord Jesus, What does that mean in my life truly? How should I be behaving? How should I be reacting? How should I be reacting with my father in heaven, but also with my brothers and sisters that I see around me? There are so many applications for this. There's so many ways that this should impact us. And in some respects, I... Yeah, I'm going to be a bit lazy. I'm not going to give you a list of things to do because sometimes lists can become nothing more than a tick box. But perhaps when we break out, and I'm giving Jono a, a 30 second warning because I know how much he loves to hit the button. Yeah, maybe we should be thinking and considering what this means in our circumstances and then encouraging one another. So, I'm going to make you do a bit of the work and ask the so what question. Okay, um, I'll, I'm just looking at the time. Oh, that's not too bad. I'll, go, I'll stop what I'm going to do as far as that. There are questions in Gruden that you can look through and they are quite helpful. But just spend, uh, I think, some, some time. I'll hand over to Jonathan. And Jonathan, you can uh, take us through the next bit.